Welcome to Southern Soul Chat, where this season we will be diving into the stories of individuals who have navigated the deeper waters of faith. I'm your host, Dr. Miranda Ferguson, and together we'll explore the journeys of people who've taken that courageous step forward in their faith. Get ready to be inspired as we uncover the incredible stories of unwavering belief and the remarkable impact it's had. If you're excited to join us on this faith-filled exploration, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Let's step forward. Welcome back, everybody. I am so glad to be back on part two of the Mosher story. So if you missed part one, you're going to want to stop this one and go back an episode so you'll know what's going on and who these fine folks are. But once again, let me welcome Heather. Hello. And Donnie. Hello. Mosher. Mm-hmm. And these guys have a podcast and a radio show. Donnie, you know I don't remember it, so go ahead. It's uh, it's Relevant Recovery Radio. It's in Houston, and it's on KPRC 950 Sundays at 1 p.m. And then it's uploaded to iHeartRadio every Sunday to a podcast where you can go back and listen to all of them called Relevant Recovery Radio. And you can follow us on any social media at Relevant Recovery Radio. Nice. So we are exploring their personal journey through addiction, recovery, and redemption, and then how they moved into having a podcast and being the wonderful folks that they are. <laughs> so how about we just give We're still it to working you? on wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. you've done a good job. We're not there yet. Well, it's close. You're not. <laughs> Go ahead. Wow. We're on a roll today. <laughs> <laughs> Should have heard before we got started. Yeah, I'm saying. Uh, no, so to pick up where we left off, I think... Uh, Heather got sober. Finally. the Lord. (laughs) Uh, And then I got sober. And I got sober April 23rd, 2013. Mm -hmm. Um, When I got sober, I was completely an atheist. I had been an atheist for 20, 25 years. I did not believe there was a God. Um, The problem is that when you go into a 12-step fellowship like the one, and and I want to quickly explain that we are in the one, but we don't talk about it uh, because we're supposed publicly. to be anonymous, yeah. right? And so because this will be publicly broadcasted, that's why we don't That's why name we're not it. naming which one, yeah. Um, but when you go in there, they talk about God, and I was like, oh, no, what am I going to do here? And I struggled with it for 18 months into my sobriety um, until I met a woman who I don't know to this day if she's a Christian. I don't know. But she was a manager where I worked, and I used to talk to her every morning. We'd both go in early. I'd go sit in her office and talk to her. And she could see I was struggling with this God idea. I couldn't figure out how to make it happen. I, I, in my whole life, anytime I needed something, I made it happen. And I couldn't make this happen. Uh, and what it really was is that I wasn't willing to let go of the belief system that I had built over 20 years. So she gives me a book called The Shack. Oh, and, my gosh, that book. Yeah. <laughs> And and I read it in like a weekend. Like I ripped through it. And, Me too. And something happened. And what happened to me at that point is um, I'm 18 months sober. And suddenly, you know, the first nine months of my sobriety, I wouldn't even say the Lord's Prayer at the end of a meeting. Like I was... Against. You're hardcore. Yeah. I love that you would. You told me that you love to meet a Christian because you just love to argue and you'd, you'd oh. say like the logistics of Noah's Ark. I mean, let's just that. talk logistics, pal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you I show was... me the floor plan, please? <laughs> yeah. The diagrams. How they didn't eat each other. And what did you do with the food? Where'd you put that? Yeah, so all that stuff. I would I'd love to argue it. And But here I am 18 months sober and I could finally say, okay, I believe in God. I believe in God. Okay. But I remember I had a neighbor and I said something about God. He goes, oh, you're a believer. And I'm like, what? He goes, <laughs> you believe in Jesus? So I was like, no. I mean, I believe he's a good dude. <laughs> like, real good dude. Yeah. He have heard great things about him. Yeah. Historically, I know he was here, but no, no, no. I just believe in God. And I remember he gave me the book, A Case for Christ. Lee Strobel. Which another I, good, mm-hmm. another good. Okay. And I still have, have it. Have you watched the documentary yet? And that's what I yes. watched. I watched the, the movie, okay. Okay. the Netflix so movie. Yeah. I didn't watch, I didn't read the book. I still have the book. But So anyways, I'm 18 months sober. Um, it's around like December of 2014. And I'm like, I'm like on fire for God. But there's no fundamental idea behind it. It's just I'm now able to say God. So it was a breakthrough for me. Right. And then I got laid off. Mm. I got laid off from work and it's like, okay, 
God was almost like, okay, now lean in. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you believe in me. But do you trust? But do you trust me? So I went through three months. I didn't look for a job for three months. Uh, I was completely, I dove into that fellowship. I sponsored a ton of dudes in three months. I did a whole bunch of stuff. And it was actually one of the better times of my life because I was building a faith. There were some days I would wake up and go, oh my God, how am I going to pay my bills? Right. And those were the days that I would repeat to myself over and over, like, God's got this, God's got this, God's got this, God's got this, like a thousand times until I started to believe it. And so for the most part, it was great. At the end of the 90 days, um, I decide to go back to work. I'm talking to my sponsor, and I'm like, hey, man, I've done everything I need to do. I'm bored. I'm going back to work. He's like, cool. The next day I get on my email, I have an email from the company I work for today. Oh, um, wow. I never looked for a job. And and for a long time, my my realization after that was, hey, if you have faith in God, he'll give you a job. Right. <laughs> but now when I look back, my realization is, is that I had a choice of how to walk through that. You can walk through it full of fear and panic and worry, or you can walk through it with faith that God's got your back. And because I walked through it 90% of the time with faith, it was easy peasy. It was spiritual. It was good. I had calm in the calamity. I had the, both of them at the same time. So we moved through sobriety. Um, we moved to, so I got sober 2013. Let's get all the way up to 2017. I had an 18 year marriage falling apart. Um, my ex-wife and I, I'm a marriage ruiner. I'm just going to say that right up front. I'm, I'm, Me too. I'm in your same club. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> oh, we're we here all look like, yeah, yeah oh, that's we're in the same club. The thing is that we had been growing apart for years, probably eight or 10 years. We had been nothing but roommates, but I wasn't doing anything to help the situation. Right. I mean, Heather knows me now. If I had my choice, I'd be running seven nights a week. I'm a goer. I like to go and do, and, and it's hard to sometimes like bring you in. Yeah, it is. And, and so anyways, that marriage was falling apart. Um, I was really seeking God near the end of 2017. Like I, I was in trouble. Um, I had been in extramarital affairs. Now this is at almost five years sober. Right. I'm, I'm cheating on my now ex-wife almost five years sober. Uh, I was closer to a drink than I had been in my entire sobriety over this. And I was at the bottom. Um, I was right back where I was before I got sober. I was, I wanted to die. I was tired. I was lonely. I hated everything. And now I'm back there at almost five years sober because the belief and worship in, when I say the word, you know, we Christians, when we hear the word, we think of the Bible. Mm -hmm. When I say the word, I mean, literally the letters G O D. That's what I was worshiping. There was no deity or creator of the universe behind it. It was just a word mm -hmm. and just a word doesn't have power, doesn't actually have anything. And so what had happened is I got to the end of that. There was nothing left. I had done all the action. I had now just plunged into like a moral abyss um, and I was in trouble. And so I started seeking, you know, it's funny when, when you're ready, God starts sending you the right people and it's in weird situations. Like I'm in sitting in the back of a cigar lounge that I used to live at having a cigar uh, this retired army guy, we called him GI Joe. His name was Joe, retired army GI Joe. GI Joe's sitting there one day. We're just kind of chatting and I mentioned God. He goes, Oh, you're a believer. Oh, here we go with that word again. And I'm like, in what? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Jesus. I'm like, no. And he goes, why? And so here's the cool thing is that he started asking questions like, why, what do you have trouble with? What do you not believe? Like he was trying to figure me out. And what he found is that I'm a fact finding intellectual. What I really worshiped was my own intellect. What I really worshiped back then was my own reasoning. And he figured that out. And so he gave me the story of Jesus chronologically, historically, factually. And for some reason, I heard it. And I don't know why. Now, I wasn't 100%. It was like this that video we watched the other night, Heather, where the guy was like, that didn't start my conversion. 
That started my confusion. It started my confusion. It gave you something to have to think on. The wheels have to turn. Yeah. Yeah. The seeds have to be planted and you have to start trying to rectify those ideas and compare them to your old beliefs in your mind over a period of time. Yes. And so I got the Bible app on my phone and I started reading the New Testament and I was ripping it apart. You know, when when I got into the 12 step fellowship that we're in, we have what's called the big book. It's our basic text. And that's what I had done there is I had gathered all of the information, but because I wasn't using practical application of that information by five years sober, I was in deep trouble. So here I am worshiping the three letters, G O D no foundation, no nothing behind it. I'm wanting to die. And I am at the just end of me. I had nothing left and I couldn't blame it on drinking because I had been sober five years. Um, and so I don't know, I want you to pick it up from here <laughs> because I don't know what you want to say. Um, I love this about you both. You'll be like, I'm not sure what you want to, uh, yeah, just say it. <laughs> Cause you know, I'll say it though. Go like, for it. So it's, so that's where he was in 2017. And we're talking like August. Mm-hmm. Cause I met you November, l- November and still married. He you're was still you're married. St- you're still technically and, married. And, but here's where I was. But so I was I. Be, I want to be clear. To someone else too. Okay. I, I want to be clear about this. I had been cheating on my ex-wife. It's important to say what the old me was doing. Because I'm not baptized at this point. So I'm going to say the old me. You've just, yeah. So, so where you're at is you actually recognize that there is a God. But mm-hmm. that's it. But and, and that's a big step for you. Mm-hmm. That's huge. There is a God, but he's not a part of your everyday no. living life, seeking, trusting, obedience. And it definitely wasn't any sort of theological backing of right. like the Christian God or something specific. Right. It was just a word. And so what had happened is that I had, because my marriage had grown so distant and it was so broken, I had begun to practice infidelity with women in the rooms of that 12-step fellowship. Now, I had had a real... and I. I don't know if she calls it justification, but I had had a talk with the people closest to me, and I'm like, I can't continue this. Like, I don't want to hurt my now ex-wife, but I can't continue to do what I'm doing. Like, this is killing me. Right. And so I had decided I'm going to ask for a divorce. Like, this thing is done. Um, I had been trying to get her to work on it. I had been asking her, let's go to counseling. She didn't want to go to counseling. Like, I remember one time I was like, we're either going to go to counseling or we're done. And she leaves and she texts me, how about we do, and she just had like always had a plan, but she wasn't willing to submit to counseling. So I had made the decision. (laughs) This is his sticking point in the story. To divorce. (laughs) But I had, I had made that decision. And I believe that's true. But I didn't have this background information when uh, I met Donnie. So I got sober uh, in Kerrville in 2016. Kerrville, Texas. And so I meet Donnie in the rooms in Katy, Texas, uh, in November of 2017. And so I had like uh, 14 months sober. Um, but my spiritual walk with God, and I mean the Christian God, because I'd always grown up with that faith. My She grew up Pentecostal. <laughs> So my mom's Pentecostal and, and my dad's oh, Southern sorry, Baptist. Oh, sorry, Pentecostal. And I said that wrong. dad's hostile. Is that what you were trying to say? <laughs> Pentecostal? <laughs> and so um, come, for me to get sober and to go into the 12-step fellowship, um, I was really uh, prejudiced against the 12-step fellowship because sometimes their language is so secular with higher power. And it isn't a religious organization. And so I was like, what can you people possibly teach me about God? Like, I already know that book, you know? Yeah. And so um, my first year, year and a half sober, I can't even, there's not enough time to even explain some of these amazing experiences I had with God. And so my faith in Jesus was just so deep. My reliance was incredible. And in the sense that I knew no matter what happened, I was okay. Whether Because I was facing five years in prison. I was still separated from my children. I owed 40000 in back child support. I had all kinds of issues, and I still didn't know if I was going to go to prison. Um, and so my friend from Sober Living had, like, a cancer scare. And so we needed to come to Houston to go to MD Anderson, like, four different times. 
And so um, I was in a relationship with a guy in Kerrville. We were both in recovery. And the first three times that we, me and her came to Houston. And it was unhealthy. He, he, yeah, he wasn't real good to me. And I should have not accepted that relationship. But I finally had enough. And I finally left him. And I went back to sober living again. And the fourth time that girl and I came here... Uh, we were in a 12-step meeting in Katy, and that's how uh, I met Donnie. And so a gr- big group of us of about 20 go out to dinner that night. Uh, let me interject real fast because mm-hmm. you mentioned something. So one of the things that we hear most when we're talking to Christians about our 12-step fellowship <clears throat> is they're like, well, that God of our understanding, there's only one God, blah, 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 blah. Correct. True, but... We are believers. There is one God, and he came down and blah, 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 right? But because that fellowship's door is so wide open, because they didn't force me to believe anything walking in the door, God found me. Mm-hmm. You know the what Holy I mean? Spirit did his work in you, and you would have never gotten sober had the door not been so wide. Correct. Because if you. I'd have walked in there day one, and they're like, Jesus is the way, you I would have turned around and gone the other way. You would have said, no, the way is back home. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I'm headed back to the bar. Yeah. I'll see you on so the flip I just, side. I just wanted to say that, that it's really important for people to understand that, yes, the 12-step fellowships are wide open with, hey, you can have a God of your own understanding. But really, it even says in the literature, most of us find religion. Mm-hmm. It's very right. well known. So going through the 12 steps, um, it doesn't contradict a religious belief because I'm, I'm a Christian and, and it doesn't contradict anything. And so, so a lot of times Christians don't want to go into a 12-step fellowship because they think it's somehow too secular and too worldly. And, it, and it's really not. It will never contradict your religion. So in fact, it, it comes it from it, uh, Christian. Christianity. It's the book of James. Right. Yeah. Our literature is the book of James. So, um, so I meet Donnie, um, and that night he was in a motorcycle club at the time. He was, you know, on his motorcycle that night wearing his cut, you know, from the Brandon, club. I'm just going to tell you I was looking good. <laughs> and I lean over to my girlfriend. I'm like, who's that dude? And she's like, oh, he's my friend. I can introduce you. So anyways, we all go to dinner that night. And this will sound so stupid, but he's, he sat across from me at dinner. There's a bunch of people. And he's of course the, I did. He's the only person who's ever pointed at all the tattoos on my left arm and said, Allison Chains? No one knows that unless you're a super duper Allison Chains fan. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. And so he struck up a conversation and it's a 90s grunge well, band. Well, he's in a biker's club. <laughs> How would he not know that? I mean, he's in a biker's club. Come on, Heather. And so... Uh, you know, it's flirting this and that. And so like later, I think outside you were like, what's a girl like you doing single, you know? And I was like, well, I'm newly single. Like five days ago, I broke up with me my boyfriend. Too. And Donnie lies to me and says me too. But here's the thing. I had <laughs> oh, made the decision. The I, I made the decision. Let though. me tell the story. I made the decision. Did you <laughs> yeah. I made the decision. So, <laughs> so, um, there, I might have lied. He, he was deceptive to me. Right. And so I thought he was single too. And so uh, we spent two or three days together while we were in town. And I remember on the third day... Um, but, but let's talk about that for a second. So... There was no pretense. There was no... Like, we really... There was something that drew us together. I mean, the very first night we met each other, there was a very obscure sticker... On the back of our big book. That has to do with, don't say, but... No, I'm not. We both had the exact same sticker in In the the exact same same spot spot on the back of our book. Right. Which you have to go to a certain workshop to even attain that sticker. It's just a weird... There was just some weird things, and we were both, like, on the same path. We were both... And so there was, like, a real... There was a draw with her that I hadn't had. Of course, there was the physical draw. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. There was the physical draw. Because, y'all, she's pretty. Well, and I'm not going (laughs) to lie that in my mind... I'm going to do the physical. She's going back home. Yeah. Cause we live four and a half hours away, right. you know, and, and, so, well, and let's say that was, that was your pattern already. Right. It was, if you weren't dabbling with the drinking and all that, but you had just switched to a new pattern. And that, and, and I was oblivious to this. I'm thinking this single is a, a solid guy yeah. in recovery and he's but, a single dude. But and, what God had planned, what I didn't know is the first three nights we hung out, we basically told each other because there was no pretense, no plans for a future. We told each other, Everything. Everything. So on the second night uh, in the 12-step world, it's called a fist step. We fist stepped with each other. We told every secret, every background, every everything. There's nothing she doesn't know about me today. And there's things that I know about him that I wish I didn't, but we know everything. <laughs> but wait, on yeah. night two, did you fess up you were married? 
not that part. That's the one thing he okay, left so out. Okay, so we just left that part. So, so here's what you know, happened. Can let me tell this? I let feel me. like I'm being du- <laughs> hey, you're double not, teamed here. You're hey, not. I just don't. I don't know. I'm about so to I'm put asking. a muscle on you. Oh, we're so not. here's <laughs> what happened. Serious. <laughs> it's got serious. Here's what happened on the third morning. Penta hostel. <laughs> hey, on the third morning, my friend's sister says, "Hey, you know he's still married, don't mm. you?" You got ratted out. And I said, This what? was supposed no. to be my like best friend. Hey, 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 let me tell this. Yeah, she ratted me out all right. Because I think that I agree with you. Go ahead. It's important. It is. And so I'm like, What? No. And I was like, he's, you know, divorced. And she's like, No, his wife doesn't know that. He still lives at home with his wife. And uh, and so I went back to the bedroom and I basically sent him a very long novel girl text you know those you know? girl texts like when you scroll, lift scroll, your scroll. phone and you can flip from top to bottom of your phone 17 times right it so was 18 i basically said things like hey she told me where you're really at with this and um here's I what can't i can't believe my best friend ratted me like that let me can i can i i'm speak? sorry go ahead no more cold brew for you yes ma'am your new best friend's about to kill you yeah <laughs> and so i basically I know what God has for me. And so I explained to him, listen, I know I'm meant to be someone's wife. I know that I'm not meant to be a mistress. I'm not meant to be a secret. I know what I deserve. And and you're not measuring up at this point. And you were deceptive. And I don't remember what all I said, but I, I know that I'm looking for a husband. And you're not single. And I said, I'm going back to Kerrville. If you're ever actually single, you can reach out to me, but I don't want to hear from you ever again unless that's the case. And so I went back to Kerrville. Um, but wait, we continued to hang out because I said I will fix this immediately. Because, I, like I, I said, I had I made the decision, Houston. but it's that's a tough call. I had been married 18 years. You don't just walk in the room and go, hey, by the way, I made some tea and I want a divorce. Right? I was scared to walk through that. And right. walking through it was the nightmare I thought it was going to be. So, but, so I go back to Kerrville and I'm telling my sponsor, listen, I messed this guy. We really connected and Mm -hmm. and here's the facts and and i'm scared spiritually what this means i'm not going to choose a guy over god i'm not going to lose my connection um and so anyways about a week later he messaged me text me and he said hey i told her i want a divorce i moved out i'm living in my brother's spare bedroom uh will you date me and i said i'll date you on the weekends if you come to kerrville and so donnie came to kerrville every weekend almost for the next five or six months and um and i still lived in sober living and so sometimes I couldn't even take a weekend pass. So he'd be at a hotel alone and I'd go back to the sober house and we'd go to 12 step meetings. And, but what that really forced was this long distance thing where we got to know each other. And I also knew that I we wasn't, had to talk a lot. I wasn't going to compromise. A lot. You talk a lot. That's just a <laughs> fact. Absolutely, Donnie, is that really a problem for you? <clears throat> no, no. <laughs> but what, I, what I think what she's that. trying to say is that you couldn't jump into something. No. Like, no it wasn't like you could just like hop into it and, well, and do will, this all over. I it removed say, the full-time physical. Right. We had to talk and get to know each other. And so I remember at one point we're having a conversation and I, because I thought because of the 12-step God background, I assumed he was a believer. And I remember one point I said to him, well, you believe in Jesus, right? And he goes, I believe he's like a really good dude. (laughs) Because she met, yeah, because she met me on the beginning of that path. So he's going through that. Maybe Jesus, maybe this, maybe Mm -hmm. Christianity. And so he's like, well, I believe he's a really good dude. And I'm like, what? She started but not crying. Like the savior and I was like, of the world, like yeah, the like died for our sins, like supernatural. Like, she started crying. I, started and I was crying, like, Oh, I just ruined and he this. Goes, Why is this a deal breaker? And I said, yes, it is a deal breaker. And then he kind of panicked and he goes, well, will you, re- will you read the Bible with me? And I said, absolutely not. Um, if you're going why? to have, but tell people why you said, no. I had forced my religion on ex-husband number two and he did it to appease me, to keep me, to keep me happy. And it was never real. It was never genuine. Right. And I won't make that mistake again. And so I told Donnie that if you're going to find a real relationship with a real God, then that has nothing to do with me. That's between you. I could read the Bible to you and I can tell you what it means to me, but you need to have your own experience so that you have your own faith. You can't have mine. And, uh, so he did. Um, And he went on a separate spiritual journey while we lived apart. And essentially what God did, and I don't know when I should say this, but this is the truth that this is how I see it. You know, when, when you have Adam and Eve, God sent Eve as a helper for Adam. And she is, has been from day one, my solid rock foundation of faith. Like 
from day one when I stumble, when I, and I want you to talk about sort of what we went through in those early days, Mm -hmm. but she's always been that rock for me to lean on as I'm learning and getting into this. Because I know I... As I become the spiritual head of the household. Because he did not qualify with the characteristics to lead a household when I met him, but I did see the potential and I saw him seeking... And so what I told him when we were dating was like, listen, I'm not looking to have a good time. I'm not looking to date. I'm, I'm looking to find my husband. And if you don't see that potential in me to be your wife, then there's no reason to continue this. Um, and so he knew I was serious. And I felt like me and God set a bar at a certain level. And you either measured up or you didn't. You could be the greatest guy in the world. But if you're not who God has for me, I don't want to entertain it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so. And here's why I think God did have her for me. I was coming out of an 18-year marriage. I had a ton of guilt over the things that I had been doing. And in my mind, I'm about to be free. I was not thinking good things. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I'm going to be out of this marriage, and I get to go on a run, and I've got all these ideas, right? And God's like, no, I'm going to send her to you. And so he really had to pursue me. He had to drive four and a half hours to Kerrville. He had to stay in a hotel. He, he had, had to work for he, it. He did. And a lot of times I would say, well, come at this time because I'm going to meet with a sponsee or I'm going to this meeting. Like, I'm not going to compromise the spiritual work I'm doing just to spend time with you. Um, and so he was willing to pursue me. And and I, I feel like res- mutual respect was built over that period of time. But he really, towards the end of that five-month period, was like, I want you to move to Houston. I want you to move to Houston. And I was really struggling with this idea. Am I choosing a guy? Am I, am I moving to another city for a guy? Is this God's will for me? And my sponsor at the time, uh, I had brought her a piece of paper where I had written pros and cons of staying in Kerrville or moving to Houston. And she just laughed at me and she said, that's cute. Tear it up. And (laughs) I like this person already. And I'm like, why? And she goes, I don't care what the pro and cons list is. She goes, Heather, what does God say? Oh, that's so good. And I'm like, well, I don't know. She goes, well, you better figure that out. Um, And so we tore up my pros and cons list that I worked so hard for. (laughs) And she told me to go home to pray and to, to get a piece of paper and make a contract with God. She said, I want you to put on the top my contract with God before I consider leaving Kerrville. I will. And what does God want me to finish while I'm in Kerrville before I even consider leaving? And so I did. I went home and prayed and made this whole list. This contract with God had about eight or nine things on it. I was technically not even legally allowed to leave sober living, uh, you know, and so there's rules like that. Like, well, I think that's probably rule number one. Yeah, she was <laughs> facing prison. But I was he, facing prison, but... Uh, but wait, here's huh. the other cool thing that we look, you know, all of these things are in hindsight. While we are dating long distance, now the whole time, like, you ready to move? You ready to move? You ready to move? You know, I'm not in the spiritual position she's in at this point. And I'm just like, nope. I'm ready to rush it. Nope. But the beauty of God's timing is that for six months, I built relationships with men, not women. Mm-hmm. Right, because I used to be that guy. I was like, mm, you know, I just get along with women better. But right? every you know, sick just... person says that. Every sick woman says, "Oh, I just get along better with men." And every sick man says, spiritually, I mean, "Oh, right. I just get along better with women." Right. And so, but over that six month period, I was going to meetings with men. I was hanging with men, going to dinners with men, like building healthy relationships. So he was growing spiritually exponentially yeah. and really becoming more leaning towards the Jesus thing, and yeah. was considering going to church and things like that. So I was like, okay, okay. And so I make this contract with God and I call my sponsor and she's like perfect and it was things like you know get off probation in Oklahoma <laughs> that's a really good start uh, I owed back rent and, and sober living I owed back rent I wanted to pay that in full before I let just different things like that so and like your obligations uh-huh taking care of your taking care of things yes and so I called Donnie and I told him and I read the list to him and when I read the list he goes oh great Heather this is gonna take freaking nine months I was, you know I was really well, spiritual were you, were, you, were you a little impatient and I what? said they don't preach the spirit. Ever heard of those? But Maybe I, a little bit. But what I said to you was really profound. It was, yeah, but I can't compromise God for you because if I do that, we have nothing anyway. Mm, that was because good. we were building a relationship based on God, which for both of us was, was the new. first time ever. We're yeah. both on our third marriage, and so that means the first two marriages, there was no God in So there. as soon as I explained to him the spiritual ramifications of bending, that I had to stick to this contract, and it might take six, nine months or a year. 
Oh, I was and infuriated. He was infuriated, but he conceded and he said, okay. Yep. And what I want you to tell you is God supernaturally took care of that whole list in two weeks. <gasps> it was weird. Two weeks. <laughs> she got like three bonuses from a job she had been at two weeks. And I paid all the back probation. I paid all the back sober rent, I, like all the sort of stuff. And so I call him and I'm like, you won't believe this, but everything on the list is done except for one thing. In two weeks. In two weeks. <laughs> and he was like, what? And I said, well, I get off probation on February 6th. And he laughed, and I was like, what's funny? He goes, that's my birthday, which I didn't know. <laughs> Talk about a present. And so that's how... Uh, but wait a minute. Mm-hmm. But where you were at spiritually, you really had a reliance on God that was... It had me awestruck. Because the other thing was, is I'm like, cool, then February 6th, I'll be there to pick you up, you off probation. Nope. She's like, nope. <laughs> when I get off probation when I get on off February probation, 6th, I'm then, putting in my two weeks at work. Correct. I'll put in my two weeks notice. And I'm like, oh, Lord, this girl's going to get here by 2026 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and so I did. But she's showing like how solid she is. Yes. And, and that she's not, she's not going to. She's not going to damage who she is. She was not going to compromise. Even though she's seeing all these things that are pointing to the right direction. Correct. God gave me the green light. It was real clear that he was like, you can move to Houston. I'll be there with you. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and here's what I'm going to do. But I still had to walk through things with integrity and, and tie up the things like two weeks in, two week notice at work was reasonable. You know, oh, I mean, they, they do like that. I'm when I was on drugs, I definitely never did that, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so I put in my two weeks on the 7th and he picked me up from work to move on the 20th. 21st of February 2018. Now I'm guessing you're divorced. Not yet. I was, okay, se- but I was physically, I was separated. Right, but you're not in this, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm just making sure I'm keeping up and with so the story. And so I was technically still married to ex-husband number two, but we had been estranged for about seven years. Right. And so he was newly separated uh, for, I don't know, seven, eight months at that time. And you need to go tap loose ends. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... If we're being honest, we had to hurry up and get divorced so we could get married. <laughs> well, yeah. that, that's what I, yeah. like, I mean. You're both married to other people. So you know what, you got to work that out real quick. This is what I love about you and our fellowship, our church, is that we can just be authentic. Yeah. You know what I mean? That we can we just talk about through. the fact that we're on marriage number three. We met Each. and started dating before we well, were no, legally divorced. Like, I beat you both. <laughs> <laughs> I beat, no, I'm, I'm above the bar with three. So congratulations to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the first marriage I mean, I've been married three times too. This is the first marriage where um, my reliance on God is more than my reliance on a guy, and that we're both seeking God together. And and the proxy of that we is that pray we together, get closer we, together. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, is that we had an agreement early on that it was God first, the the twelve step fellowship second, spouse third, a spouse third. Mm-hmm. So but, we come in third with each other, with God and the spiritual walk coming first. And I think that that's one thing why it works so well for Donnie and I in our relationship is because we're, we're both in the same 12 step fellowship. And so we understand what those obligations mean of the time that we have to spend working with other people or going to meetings or service commitments or all of those sort of things. So nobody like gets upset or angry because you you know, a, how important that is Mm -hmm. for you individually and, how important it is for the people you're working with. The only time we fight about it is trying to book the room first at home. We have a bedroom that's converted into what we call the sponsorship room. So it's, you can go in there and have privacy. It's got chairs and a table. I'll book it at like 10 a.m. He'll book it at 930 and get it before me. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's a really hard thing to have to fight over y'all. I'm really sorry. But I just think I want to say as far as our, our relationship, there's been some really amazing things that we've walked through, but one being uh, um, our men's. And so when we got married, Donnie had about seventy seven thousand in credit card debt. That um, I made that I made in, in sobriety. sobriety. When I got sober I was actually debt free. He's <laughs> he's horrible with money. He what? would shop and I don't live like that, but I owed all this back probation fees and forty thousand in back child support. And so we did have this mountain ahead. So we said, Listen, let's you know, pray and take the five years and clean this up. Like that was our whole goal of the first five years of our marriage. Mm-hmm. What <clears throat> and and we are we are almost there. But what I want to like, I don't want to skip over which part the early days. I mean, yeah. So you guys get you guys. She moves to Houston. How yeah. long? How long does it take to work it all out between spouse? Because you can't get married if you're married. That's still so. I moved how it here goes. in February of 2018, and we got well, married in June well, of 2019. Hold on. So, so God fixes some things right away. God's hand is all over this. There is just no doubt. So. It's March. We're looking for a house to rent. Oh, you were dishonest. About the dogs. 
No, I was talking about your license. Oh, that <laughs> story. I'm this. So yeah, so <laughs> my now wife, then girlfriend, had the most messed up ID situation I've ever seen. Yeah, you, you couldn't. You didn't want to try to prove who I was or steal my identity. I and while we're looking for <laughs> we're looking for a house to rent. My truck gets broken into because Miss Oklahoma here leaves listen, her purse laying right in plain view. Listen, I grew up in Oklahoma. You don't lock doors. <clears> you don't lock your car. And I had no idea you couldn't leave your purse in the truck. It's Mayberry. In Houston, yeah. And so they smashed the window and stole my purse, which was my only form t- of ID to prove who I was by name. Which is great because between March and it took probably to August or September, it took time because we had to get so many documents and all that. But by the time we were done, her entire identification situation was clean. Mm-hmm. Right, her social matched, her driver's license matched, which wasn't the case for the last ten years. Right, it was very messy. Right, and so I think that I would have never taken the actions to clean that up had we not been robbed. Yeah, had your purse. I would have just snatched. kept going with the bad ID, yeah. you right. know. And so it really forced my hand because then when I had an ID, then I could go finish the community service that I owed the state of Oklahoma. You know, they need an ID for that. Right. So I took care of that. And, and at I, this time too, I'm. I'm tearing the Bible apart. Like, I am just an information black hole at this point, just taking in all the information I can. I don't have application down yet. Right. But you're absorbing. <clears throat> but where she is, again, the rock that God sent me, I would read something, and I'd come out of the room, and she'd be sitting there, and I'd be like, you know what? It says this, but I don't agree. <laughs> and she'd go, okay, keep reading. Like, she just encouraged me. She never argued it. She didn't fight it. She was letting God do what God needed to do in me without an opinion. She just let it happen. Because it's interesting with you being, you know, 49 years old or whatever old you were at the time. I was 45. Whatever. Close enough. (laughs) My point is, is that you don't have 45 years of, of doctrine and theology being taught to you like I did growing up. And so there are just certain theological truths or doctrinal beliefs that I am absolutely certain why I believe and what I believe and where it is in the book. And um, I know that you didn't have those, but I don't want to force you to believe what I believe just because I say that's what the truth is. Right. And and you also didn't want to fight it or or argue with me to create animosity around the Bible. Because there's definite ideas that you've had along the way that he'd be like, but what about this? And I'm, I'm thinking that's definitely not a biblical idea, right. <laughs> but go ahead and look for it. Like, yeah. you know, go read some more. That's but the beauty <laughs> of all of this is that God put the right people in front of me at the right times. The scales came off my eyes, my ears opened. And because I came to this sort of on my own, like God put the drive in my heart to read the Bible, to learn about Christ, there is no unconvincing. Like my soil was fertile. Mm -hmm. Like there is nothing on this planet, like, cause I am still a skeptic and an information junkie and I love conspiracy stuff and I love all this weird like stuff, right? There is nothing that can make my belief that Jesus Christ is the son of God, God incarnate that died for our sins, was buried and resurrected and ascended. Like there's nothing that can change and that. And so once he really found that faith, uh, he asked for me to start going to church to, you know, with him. And so we tried out lots of different churches. And, uh, oh, Lord, I was, it was a trek. I was very patient with what he was asking and where he was asking to go. Okay, so I'll say this, and I don't want to name the church because no, no, I don't no, want to be disparaging, a, but there's a very large church here in Houston. Not Houston. And he, and he was like, let's go. And I'm like, oh, no. But this yeah. pastor, the way he preached, opened the door for me. And I was I was hearing mm-hmm. what I needed to hear. Because Donnie was expecting to be judged and condemned by, air quote, Christians. Right. And because of the life I had been living for 25 years. And so I appeased him. I was like, sure, we'll go. You know? And after a few months, he was like, yeah, let's look for a new one. Like, right. you know, He had spiritually outgrown that. And I'm like... Thank God. <laughs> so we tried out some other ones. But by the time we got married, he was really like, it's important to me that we get baptized together. And so I think we had been married a week. We got married June 28th of 2019, and we were baptized together July 14th of 2019. And so we got to do that. I had been baptized as a teenager, but I really wanted this new beginning, this new born-again life with him, with my husband. And so that was really cool that we got to experience that. But it was the first time I'd ever felt joy before. But that it seemed to be a real profound experience for him. Like he talks about, because throughout my spiritual walk, there's been plenty of times where uh, I call it a God download, where like God speaks to me, but it's like a whole lot of information that I know instantly, mm-hmm. like supernaturally. I can't explain it, but um, 
or I know God is telling me this, or I know with discernment it's that. And I was getting to watch him have his first beginning moments of, of the, the spiritual walk. And so I was so excited for him too. Um, it was a profound thing to watch you grow in faith Mm -hmm. and grow into someone who deserves to be the head of the household and to lead the family. And, and so I'm tying it into my kids. So I had lost my kids for about seven and a half years. Well, let me, let me say this real quick. Prior to July 14th, 2019, I feel certain that I had never felt joy before. Ever. Yeah. You just said that was like the most joyful. When I came up out of the baptismal, I felt a physical heat in my chest. I felt it like it was a physical thing and I felt flooded with joy. It was definitely the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt in my mind. Nobody can convince me differently. And it was the first time I had ever felt joy in my life. And so um, I wanted to kind of tie that into uh, us finding the church we're at now and how we know Miranda and stuff. So I had this this damage to repair of getting back in my kids' lives. I was not even allowed phone calls or visitation still at this point. And so um, I got all my legal stuff done, all the probation. I'm off paper. I'm not going to prison. And that was in February of 2020. And so I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go to court in Oklahoma to see my kids. Well, March of 2020, the world stopped. Oh, that yeah. little thing. And so all yeah. the courts were shut down until about August, September. So then I uh, got an attorney. And so I, ha- we had to start, I had to start with supervised visitation. And even though they were 14 and 17, um, I hadn't seen them in seven and a half years. But Donnie was by my side the whole time, driving me 14 hours round trip just so I could start with a two-hour visitation mm-hmm. uh, supervised. He wasn't even allowed to come in. And so he was at my parents. And I'm at... A, we would drive up on Friday up to Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. We would get an Airbnb or stay at her parents she would get her two-hour visit we'd drive back on sunday we did this for a year every other weekend for a year and and so i don't know if we can describe (laughs) how exhausting that is it was rough but um it was effort that i owed my kids it was effort that god required of me to deserve to be back in their life but it was rough Um, it was valuable it was somehow rewarding spiritually yes and i just i just um so we were shocked to, during this whole custody process of trying to get back in my kid's life that my youngest, my son, was like, I want to come live with you. And I'm like, what? Really? You know, he doesn't even remember me. He was seven when I left. And, uh, and so we buy a bigger house and we set up his bedroom and we do all this stuff. And who knows how much money we spent on the whole court stuff side of it. 60 to 80 grand. Yeah. And between so, attorneys and travel and it was it yeah. was quite so a bit I, but we don't you know here's the thing i say it, it don't care yeah yeah and so I we get, were doing what was right for the first time in our lives so i get my son here and i'm thinking we got to get him in church we got to get serious about finding a church and donnie and i had talked about the three things that we were looking for in a church we wanted a church um that is debt free or helps the community in some way, like that's fiscally responsible. We wanted a church that preaches the Bible and doesn't twist an agenda. And I wanted old hymns. <laughs> I grew up Pentecostal, like right. I said. So I listen to really old hymns all the time alone in my car because no one sings them anymore. Um, and so I was asking a girlfriend if she knew of any churches and in the area. By the way, we had taken him, we had tried a few churches with him. Yeah. And we were not going well. Liking them, yeah. And um, we're both heavily tattooed for the people that are listening. We have tattoos from shoulder to wrist both and of us. some on our <laughs> hands. And we would walk into certain Baptist churches and, and we never even got a hello. Or even non denominational. Um, yeah. And some places were nice. It just didn't feel like home. It wasn't the right place, yeah. you know? Right. And so, yeah, I don't want to put anything on them. No, no. It just wasn't home for us. Right. And so um, my girlfriend mentioned our church, the Met, and they said she said they have a wonderful youth ministry and tons of high schoolers. And I'm like, that's perfect to get my son there. Yeah, she said they have an amazing student ministry. So my kid was not excited about it. He didn't want to go at all. But mm-hmm. we all went, and the first night that we walked in to church, the first morning, Sunday morning, we walked into church, they're playing an old hymn on the speaker before the service. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know? They do said, old Did hymn. you hear that? I mean, I, I haven't heard one there since, but yeah. <laughs> I think they're working on it. <laughs> and uh, then we started to pay attention to the fiscal responsibility of all they do in the community and all that stuff. And and we were blown up. We listened to a few sermons of Max prior to going. Prior to going and um, just well, remember we were listening to, to that one, and we both had tears coming yeah. out of our eyes. I was and like, I just okay. like this guy um, is sharing God's word for sure. He's coming out of the Bible and he's sharing the fallible nature of all humans and including himself. 
And mm-hmm. I loved that he was so raw and honest about how he's not perfect. And uh, so that's how we found the home. But what's crazy about it is that right away we knew we wanted to join the church. And I mean, we had home. been going to five, six, seven churches. We were there three, four months at a time, never felt the need to join. And within six yeah. months, my son decided he did not want to live with us anymore. He wanted to go back to his dad's and grandma's Yeah, we wanted to join the Met within a month. Yeah, and so like, we literally. did. But we I did. just feel like that's how God works, though. Like, my motive was to try to find a church for my kid. Yeah. But God's like, no, it's for y'all. Yeah. Here's your home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, Here I believe you go. that. <laughs> and so here's the, some of the crazy things that have happened once we found our home, because that's really what we consider it. It's our home. Uh, a, a cool thing happened to us when were we riding in the car together? Like all the time. What yesterday. Where did we go yesterday? I don't know. We were riding in the car. And I had been sitting in some scripture and I said, Heather, I'm sitting in this scripture and here's what I really got out of it. And she goes, oh, totally agree. And she's like, yes, and this and this. First time we've agreed on scripture (laughs) ever. (laughs) Finally, like it was a breakthrough yesterday. And the reason I bring that up is that just in her, just being that solid foundation for me, I have been able to go through all of the questions and the skepticisms and all of that stuff and figure this thing out until the Holy Spirit is finally frustrated with me and yelling, like, enough! You know right. what I mean? Uh, and I kid, but... <laughs> um, so probably three years ago, two years ago, I'm sitting in... The room that we do sponsorship is also just a quiet room. This is in our old rental house, so it would have mm-hmm. been a little over two years ago. And I get this message from God, and and I when I used to hear people say that, I, I thought they were crazy people because I didn't understand it. And today I know that it's just unquestionable. When God speaks to me, there's you no know. question. Oh, you know. You know. Mm-hmm. And God told me that I'm going to preach, and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Like, do you know how many people I've hurt? Like, but this are you is kidding how, me? This is how selfish we are, though. When he told me that God told him he went, to, he's supposed to preach. I'm like, great. How is this going to affect me? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to like, be under a microscope. Yeah, I don't want to be a preacher. <laughs> but here's the cool one. thing: is yeah. is that a little over two years ago, God made that clear to me. He wanted me to preach, and and I do have a gift of being able to speak and being able to. Um, a little work. too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, the cold breeze don't help, Heather. I know. We're we are asked to speak in our fellowship a lot. Right. We're so I, I do have a gift in that area that God has given me. It's not a natural ability, or it's not mine. It's of Him. A year later, after that, He puts it on my heart to stop cursing, which was weird. Remember when I told you I was like, God put this on my heart, and it's like, really? So, that's the one. So that's stupid. all this all the stuff, and you picked that one. That's the one. <laughs> And I couldn't figure out why. And I was talking to my friend Neil, and Neil is like, because of what happened already, God has put it on your heart to be a preacher. That means you have to be at a level above. You can't be cursing anymore. And so he puts that on my heart. And so I'm just kind of, I'm learning. I'm soaking everything in from the Bible. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to be with the Holy Spirit in meditation and prayer. And then we find the met. And I just fall in with the pastors. I just fall in. Like, it's like it was God's plan all along. Like he knew what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Crazy, right? I mean, that's just bizarre. <laughs> I mean, and and so I I uh, I get one of the pastors there. I asked him to mentor me. Here's what I love. We went to lunch. And he said, "What do you? What does that mean?" I was like, "I want somebody to help me." And he goes, "What? Learn the Bible better?" And I said, "No, I want more people in the kingdom." Mm-hmm. And he said, that's the answer I was looking for. He said, I'm not going to mentor somebody to teach them the Bible better so they can spout. Right. You know, because what I know today is that knowledge means nothing. If I have no practical application, if I'm not sitting with the Holy Spirit, what am I doing? And I think that's why our background in the 12-step fellowship is so pivotal because because we've had to learn how to like live out and our faith through the actions that we mm-hmm. take. And so we're already pretty familiar with learning how to like not just talk the talk, but walk the mm-hmm. walk. And so I think that's why when you became a Christian, you just like it ran 110% mm-hmm. all in, you know? It's just who you are. It's the first time in my entire life I have felt like I am on the exact path that God has wanted me all along. I feel the most comfortable in my skin today. I feel the most content I've ever felt 
today. It's like I'm suddenly, that's why I'm not fighting it anymore. You know, I was talking to Scott about it. I was like, you know, sometimes I wonder, was that voice God's or mine telling me that I'm going to preach? You know, I've got pride. Maybe it was me. And he said, no, I'm pretty sure it was God. And you need to stop questioning it. You do have a gift. And I'm like, okay. Two things I want to point out that I think is important for us to be honest and share about is even though we're giving the highlights of some really awesome stuff God's done with us and how he's changed us, Mm -hmm. like at the same time, I think the year we got married, we had really poor communication for a few months, chunk, as around Christmas. Yeah. And, and we had to go into, so we got married July of 20 or June of 2019 by Christmas because you threw the Christmas cookies. We were in counseling. You so, threw Christmas cookies. So there was a box of like really gourmet bad person, Christmas Miranda. cookies. She was a really bad that person. That is that in her. Yes. And I forget what the argument was even about, but all I, oh, I rolled my eyes at you. That's why you threw the cookies, remember? So he that was not I'm, December. They sent the cookies early because that was when I was taking care of the RV. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, I rolled my eyes at him. He threw cookies. Because I was pouring my heart out. I was literally pouring my heart and she rolled her eyes at me. I was like, oh. Because these cookies got to die. Because here's what's fun. Here's how selfish people work. Don and I are both selfish people. And so I remember coming home. We had had some uh, some uncomfortable conversations, and he really wanted to tell me how he felt. And so I come home, and he's like, "You know, when this happened, I just and I just like, oh my god, really? Like we're gonna still talk about how you feel? <laughs> this is so the last I'm, thing I want to do." So what I'm hearing is you're a normal married couple. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Okay. I just, I just wanted to clarify to our <laughs> listeners that. You are a regular functioning married couple. So what was great is we were both willing to go to counseling mm-hmm. and that counselor was amazing. And he taught us some really great communication styles that we and still use today that we still use today. And we found out that 90% of all of our arguments are because we go into a conversation with different goals. A lot of times he thinks I'm problem solving and I'm not, I'm just educating him. I just want him to know what information I know, like how my day went. She wants oh, me just to listen, I, which yeah. is crazy because I know she wants me to fix everything. And so we end up miscommunicating, which leads to an argument. Yeah. And so I just wanted to point out that like, yes, we've had some really amazing things along our spiritual journey and in our marriage. Well, let, let's bring up another one human. then. So the beauty of that counseling was, is that we were in counseling in March of 2020. Mm-hmm. And we were about to spend the better part of a year to, together in a home 24-7. Yeah, and, what, and who could have known that was about to happen? No right. One. And what was really amazing when that happened... We thrived. ...is we thrived. Like, we had lunch and tea in the middle of the afternoon, like clockwork together, just to catch up and see how the day is going. I was doing yoga in the gym room. You were working in the other office. Like... We didn't have... We were cooking a, all of our meals at home. Yeah. It was. I mean, I was washing cereal boxes, and I was a little crazy at first, but that passed. But my point is, it's like, we almost felt bad to talk to other people because so many people didn't do well. They were suffering. Mm-hmm. And and I get where that's coming from. Or like, my loneliness. prayer meditation got huge. I was in the Bible for an hour a morning, like... Which Everything is, was just so great. I really enjoyed it. COVID was good for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the friend of mine, we call it the COVID sprinkle. Mm-hmm. That God had a little bit of COVID sprinkle yeah, because we experienced the same thing. We, Jeremy and I got way closer mm-hmm. and he's been here now for three years <laughs> and we're not divorced. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a miracle. Yeah. Um, but we felt the same. Like we didn't want to talk about COVID to people because we were thriving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. were thriving. And like I said, more time with God, more time with family. Mm-hmm. It, it really stripped everything away. Mm-hmm. And we were just, we didn't have anything else, anywhere else to go or do. So we just centered in on yeah. like, going back to the basics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And God was in the center of the basics for yep. us. And we got, so we get through 2020 um, halfway through 2021, we finally got to not go back and forth to Oklahoma every other weekend. Um, God also removed a porn addiction from me at that time. Like that had been a problem. It had been something that Heather was not... Not cool with. Not cool with. Um, and I it's something felt- that I battled for a while, the trying to stop. And because of our background in addiction, I understand some... Uh, 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 being powerless over an addiction. And I've watched him struggle with shopping. I've watched him struggle. I wasn't around for his alcoholism, right? He was already sober when I met him, but I've watched him struggle with porn or food or shopping issues. And it's the same type of illness that goes back to a spiritual deficiency. And so when watching him go through that, of course, I wasn't cool with it. I think when a couple is married, 
all of your energy should go towards each other, never away from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that that just breeds better bonding and true intimacy. And our intimacy is amazing since. But he, those were new ideas to him. His previous wives were cool with that. Yeah. You know, like so and, many wives are today. Well, he's not going out. He's not fooling around. Yeah, but like, the problem cool is, is that. that like God again gave me a very clear message one day when I was sitting quietly, like she says, the God download. I had been fighting the idea that it was wrong because I, I wasn't doing anything behind her back and I wasn't, um, I was faithful to her. And, but what God told me like in an instant was you're stealing energy from her. You're asking her to do things that she doesn't want to do. And when you guys are intimate, your mind is not on her. Mm -hmm. It is somewhere else. And I just knew in, a, in an instant, okay, this is not okay. And so God over time removes that. Um, and then 2021 is also about, so another bad habit I have, and I'm going to say with women, I'm going to say this has always been there, but this is something that I needed Jesus to remove was that Heather and I would get an argument. Now when we were dating, when we were dating, I was calm. I'm like, don't you worry about it. I got you. Don't well, that's, you worry that, that's about that whole, like, I'm trying to get you in and this is right. how great I am. And I'm, but I'm you put a ring it. on it. Oh, yeah, it's, bait and it's switch. over. I bait wasn't going to say it, but thank you, Heather. Do we want to get into bait and switch no, today? We none no. of us want to get in. None of us do. <laughs> so here's the thing I, I, we would get in an argument, and when she said something I didn't like, I would yell at her. And I mean, yell uh, and curse. And it was ugly. Um, and near the end of 2021, oh, my, my bathroom wall, that was so near the end of 2021, God starts convicting me and God is like, you will not talk to my daughter that way. Like it was, it was real strong. February of 22, I turned 50 and it was a really crazy month and for me. And you had a lot of close deaths. Your mom died in January. My uh, very first sponsor your, your died. First sponsor I, like died it was a weird year for me, but let's not discount what I did. She yeah. and I got in a big, big argument, a big fight. He wanted and, to buy an RV. And no, I punched, sir, we're not buying an RV. <laughs> and I punched three holes in our bathroom wall. Well, you know, redecorating. And he had never I've broken never something, something like, like that right, right before. And I'm just thinking, what in the world? And I knew that it had nothing to do with me or the RV or any of That's that. An it's internal, him. Yeah, it's an internal And thing. he's got to work something out with God. And I remember just being really calm and nice to him the whole day, you know, and letting him go through it and not, you know griping at him for what he did to the bathroom we'll deal with the wall another day and i remember when we went to bed that night you were like you were like you were in bed and i was getting undressed you were in bed i was in bed and you were like so you're not mad at me for what i did to the wall and i said wait a minute you're mad that i'm not mad <laughs> and he wanted me to be mad because he felt so bad about what he did i felt he, so he guilty. wanted me to punish him right and i said i'm not playing that you're going through something and i love you and it'll be different later but she also said I forgive you. Yeah. And I'm like, that is a novel idea. What? Yeah, you mean I did something wrong and you just forgive me? Right. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to do with that. Okay, so then that's in 2022. Well, here's the thing is God starts drawing me in closer. So now I'm helping teach some classes at a uh, church. Mm -hmm. I get involved in um, a leadership program called God Cadre to become uh, a facilitator of a small group. Like... The church is pulling me in. I don't see what's going on, but I'm I'm serving way more. I'm doing more. And I'm involved more. And for me, it's more. not even about all of it because he's willing to go and do. But what's beautiful is I couldn't impart uh, Christian foundational ideas into him for the most. But he's around men who are teaching him how to be a man. Right. Uh, you know, with yeah. these ideas, and and I'm just so grateful for you hanging well, out with those guys. And you know, mushrooms grow in the dark. Yep. But they die in the light. Mm -hmm. Are we doing mushrooms? And so the secret came out. No, that out. was that was the first episode. Yeah, oh. that was, so that I let the <laughs> secrets out. out of the bag. I'm <laughs> I'm hanging out with men, uh, Christian men smoking cigars, or I'm in small group, and I start talking about it. Like I'm, I'm yelling at my wife, and I don't want to anymore. Right. Um, I started not only repenting to the Lord in prayer, but I started re I started asking her. Yeah. I started telling Heather, like I am sorry that I just did that. Like every time, and it was embarrassing, and I hated it. And I got tired of it. But I was doing everything I could. So Heather and I are driving about a week, week and a half ago, and I'm, I'm going to give a talk coming up on April 9th or o October 9th. And I said, hey, when do you think the last time was I yelled at you? And I don't even remember. It's been around a year that I've even raised my voice. 
Right. Like, and, in fact, uh, we've sort of switched a little well, bit. I'll yell at you because you deserve it sometimes. But what I'm saying is, so when people... See, the Holy Spirit haven't mentioned it to her yet. Right, <laughs> so right, okay. right. Yeah. And so here's what's interesting. When someone will meet just me or someone will meet just Donnie, but I'll tell people, wait till you meet my husband. We're both alpha. We're both, you know, and they're like, no way. Do y'all kill each other? You know, because mm-hmm. we are very intense people, very passionate people. Um, but it's it's creepy almost how well we normally get along. Um, cause we're just really considerate of the other. And this last year has been probably the best year of our entire relationship. I it's think it's been just, blissful. It just keeps getting better and better because it's more mature and, and it's more rich and it's more considerate of the other. And but that's not to say we don't disagree. We yeah, just yeah, yeah. disagree differently now. Yeah. Right. Right. And this You're is literally all the time. This, <laughs> <laughs> but this all in the is, presentation. <laughs> you know what it is, is that my spirit alone, alone by itself is so broken that I need extra Jesus. I need extra spirituality. I need it. And, but you're and also not looking for your fulfillment and your joy from Heather. No. no. And that's no. huge. Mm-hmm. Like no. you're you're seeking that that intimate need inside of your heart with Jesus. Because what I found is that anything, anything external of me, anything of this world is is counterfeit validation, yeah. Yeah. counterfeit love, counterfeit content, all of it. And what I find for men, it might be the things like the RV or the boat or the bigger house or the giant bank account or the, you know, whatever. And for women, it's more usually codependency in, in a relationship of like a man being my higher power, right? And somewhere along the way, I realized, because... Trust me, when we first got together, realizing what his history was and what he was doing behind his wife's back and, and all it of that. It was a history of awesome, Miranda. And so I... I Ask her his question. Here's what's crazy <laughs> is I never was afraid of him cheating on me. Right. And it's not because... So for two reasons. Number one, I see his character today and what God's molded him into. So I just don't think he's the kind of guy that would anymore. I think he's completely changed. But even if he got spiritually sick again in the future, he would be the kind of guy that would cheat. Mm-hmm. I don't get to control his spiritual walk. and But I know that I'm so okay with me and God that it doesn't matter what he does. Right. That I'm always going to be okay because I have God. I don't have to have him. Yeah, so I again, just choose you're not him. depending. Yeah, right. you're, you're not your whole life, your whole everything like in the past because I can relate to that. In the past, if it falls apart, it all falls I mean, apart. Not, mm-hmm. Which is almost my catalyst with marriage number two falling apart. Once he rejected me, when he didn't want me, then that meant I had no value. Mm-hmm. And that just meant screw life. Yeah. Balls to the wall. I'm just going to go get loaded and have a good time. Yeah. And um, Cause what it, does de- it, it destroyed mm-hmm. me. I had no real esteem. I had no identity in Christ. And so I think that that was pivotal for me before I met you, that mm-hmm. I had already went on this journey of finding out who God says I am, not who Heather wants to be. Uh, not, not what I think my friends see, but who does God say that I am? Because whatever that opinion is, is what I need to believe. And and it's crazy. I'm the time. God gave me a career where I have made good money for a long time. And I used to need to spend it all on stuff. Mm -hmm. And through these last few years of this journey, the closer I get to Christ, the less stuff I need. Like literally, what were we talking about recently? Where I, It was $12. I'm reading the, the book that Jeremy gave me, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at the Table. And I wanted to go ahead and put it on my Kindle because it's easier to read than a physical book. <laughs> right. And I'm looking at it and I said, hey, does this come out of my fun money? And she goes, yep. yep. And I said, well, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I didn't want to spend $12. Right. But we've gotten to a place where the more we seek Jesus, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we do the service, right? Be a servant, disciple. We're discipling several people. We're, And none of this is bragging. Again, my spirit is so broken alone without God that I have to do all this extra stuff right. <laughs> to, to be who I am today. And we're, so we're doing all of this stuff. And the more I do, the less I need anything of this world. I just don't. Because I think what most people logically know is true when I say it, but don't really understand is that self-obsession is the cancer of human existence. Mm -hmm. And we're all so obsessed with ourselves, my wants, my plans, what I deserve, what makes me happy, my truth. And that's why social media is such. It's such a lie. Mm. Yeah. It's such a Mm -hmm. lie. And it's like what the, the trick that we have found is flipping that and saying what I want actually doesn't matter. 
Mm-hmm. My feelings are not facts. They will fade. They will change in 10 minutes. Yep. And instead, let me discard what I think I deserve and say, what does God want from me? What does God's kid want from me? How can I serve someone? How can I be helpful? Not because I really want to do all of that. I really don't. I'm selfish. Right. But because the byproduct is, is I get to be comfortable in my own skin and I get to feel purpose. Mm-hmm. And so that's way better than any drug I've ever done. And, right. and the beauty of this, I know we're probably getting close to time, but the way I want to wrap it up with a nice pretty bow is this, that... Wrap it up. What are you talking about? No, we're just going to go balls to the wall, like Heather said. So, I still got to talk about a podcast. Well, <laughs> so talking about? I just want to say that early on in the relationship, she is definitely that spiritual foundation for me to walk, and, and, and she helped me um, become the spiritual head of the household today. But that what that journey looks like, and the reason our marriage is successful today is because God is right in the center of it, And we went from a corporate relationship. Every marriage I've ever had, every marriage she's had, every relationship we've ever had is corporate. Mm -hmm. And a corporate relationship is is that I, the husband, am the corporation. She, the wife, is a salesperson. And as long as she's giving me what I need, our relationship is good. But the second she's not giving me what I need, I need a new salesperson. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But what's happened over the last three to four years is our relationship has become covenant. And what that means is that when she's going through, and let's let's start with me because it was me for a while. When I am going through something and I begin to lean out from the relationship, she leans in. Mm-hmm. She's not looking for what I'm giving her. She's leaning in looking for what she can give me. Mm-hmm. And and recently, over the last year, she got a promotion. She's been pretty stressed out at work. Some things have been going on. And I get to lean in now. She has been leaning out with just stress and all those things. And I get to go, hey, babe, don't worry about it. I got it. Here, let me get the dishes. Let me get the laundry. Let me do what I can do to help you. What do you need? You know, I, I cook. I, I Whatever I can do. <clears throat> because that's what God meant it to be, is a covenant where I am I am more interested in what I can do for her than what she can do for me. Right. You're not looking for a return. Right. And that's the way I think. It's not a score. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the way we're living now. And I think that's why we're so happy in our marriage right now. Yeah. yeah and let me make, let's say this because you know, like a lot of people out there Christian or not and be like, well, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. That all sounds great. Cause let, and let me reassure all of you out there listening. The minute God comes out of the center of this, it all falls apart. Yes. Oh, yes. it would take no I mean, time at I mean, all. These are both wonderful people, but the, the reason why this is working and they're learning and growing is because a with God, you're growing constantly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 But if he's not in it, it, it goes... It's gone. Mm-hmm. Oh, you! it would Very literally quick. look like a plane at 36,000 feet and you just turn off the power. In fact, because we know that falling back into self-will is generally our default and, and the hardest thing to avoid, he actually has like a... 10 minute defcon plan of how to lock me out of all finances if i relapse <laughs> she's a heroin addict so we got to be prepared for this everything that's right she said i'll pawn everything yeah yeah if we go to defcon go. if we go to defcon one i have to immediately call every credit card company i have to shut her off from everything yeah. now i don't see that happening no, but i'm just saying to her point all of this is only because of jesus yeah, only because take, of god i want you take that away. like our listeners need to hear that this works not because they're great people, not because they have superpowers. It works right. because they've chose to put God in the center, which is where God's place is. It's yeah. a strand of mm-hmm. it's a strand of three. Yep. And when you take one of those out, that's when things fall apart. So if you're sitting in something that's falling mm-hmm. apart, go back and check what what's the rope. Like mm-hmm. from church Sunday, what's the rope you're hanging on to? Right. And you can even take it a step backward. We're not great people, no. right? The only oh, I reason we're really say it out there like we're, that. we're so selfish. We're really not good people. And here's the thing: the whole reason we started this journey in the first place, let's just be honest, is because we burnt our lives to the ground. Yeah, yeah. we had no choice. It, well, really, you had nowhere to go but up. We had nowhere to go. I had nothing left. I had no options. Death was next for me. You know. Yeah. But don't you know? I mean, don't you see? I know you see, especially in what you guys do for your everyday lives and how you invest in people. That God does His best work when you're your most broken. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, hundred percent. People are so much more receptive when depressed and and because some people don't see the need for God or to change anything because for a long time, if it's not super bad, you're still going to blame other people, blame externals, blame the spouse, blame the parents, blame the childhood. Mm -hmm. Very few people want to take a look at their own flaws within themselves and do some real spiritual work. Um, It's a very uncomfortable thing to come to the realization and be like, you know what? 
I'm kind of a crappy person. Well, and in therapy, <laughs> um, like when I used to have ther- do therapy sessions with people, the thing is, is that you are comfortable in what you recognize. So I recognize this crazy and I know what it looks like. So for me to step out of the crazy, that's scary mm-hmm. because I've never been anything but crazy mm-hmm. or Dis- I've never been... Dis- it- Dysfunction can yeah. be comfortable. So at, dysfunction at a point. is yeah. is very comfortable because I I know what to expect with dysfunction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the minute like with Dottie saying, you know, I had to, the word, like that's uncomfortable mm-hmm. because you didn't know what to expect, mm-hmm. and so you had to go down a, a journey, a path mm-hmm. to get to even where you're at today, mm-hmm. and that's what you know. It's, and I want to encourage our listeners: it's okay to not know. Oh yeah. Yes, it's okay uh, to not know. It's okay to even have doubt at times. Um, it's okay to say, you know what, I, I would love to know what God's will is, but I don't always, Yeah, you know, and I don't know what I would look like or what I would be like being someone connected to God. I didn't know. Cause when I we're got, hoping you will someday yeah, though, shut your mouth. <laughs> it's not going to be today, folks. <laughs> when I, I remember when I got sober, I thought I can't go to like rock concerts anymore. Yeah. So, cause if you're a Christian, you can't have a fun life. Right. You can't do anything. And I just thought, who's Heather without like a mosh pit or tattoos, you know? Right. And I just, the truth is, is that a lot of times, no matter what the problem is, let's say it's not drugs and alcohol. Let's say it's any other thing, whatever someone's going through. I mean, gosh, run through the list. We've done them all on the show, right? Porn, gambling, food, shopping. Even just depression and anxiety. Okay. What I'm saying is you're not, someone's not going to get well by focusing on that problem. Mm-mm. Your, your anxiety is not going to go away. The more you read books on anxiety and focus on anxiety, mm-hmm. I have to be willing to instead focus on the solution, which is my relationship with God and what God wants me to do. Mm-hmm. And if I build a habit of doing those godly actions, God removes the anxiety. God removes the depression. Right. He God comes gives, in and takes it away. Yes. Well, and, and the mistake I think we made in every marriage we ever had, if there was any God, it was the idea that we could fix it ourselves. Oh, yeah. yeah. The idea that we could fix anything ourselves, that I could fix finance, romance, work, yeah, that relationships. That you actually had the ability yep. and to the, be able to whisk it up and change it. Yeah, and the counterintuitive thing is, is is no. If I point everything at Jesus and I follow Jesus and I put go all in on Jesus and make me a servant, Jesus, and what do you want me to do, Jesus? I don't have to fix all those things over here. I don't mm-hmm. need to worry about finance and romance and relationships. Because God fixes those. Yeah. And so anytime I'm trying to help someone that seems to be real stuck in a place and they're like, but I have tons of faith. I believe in Jesus. I go to church. I ask them, please spend some time praying and asking God honestly, what area of your life specifically are you ignoring God around? I promise you there's something. Mm -hmm. And I promise you it has nothing to do with what this problem is. Yeah. There is something else in your life you're ignoring God around and you're not going to experience any freedom until you start obeying God in that area. And I bet it's quiet just like that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're already over an hour. We're just going to wrap it up. You're not coming back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't get you back. So let's 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 shoot here. So, how quickly? How did you end up with the radio station and the podcast? Okay. And then what I want to go from there, so that we can just move through it, is what what have you seen? How have you seen lives change? from sharing mm-hmm. these stories. Cause this is what you guys do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you dive in a little more into to more specific topic topics, topics. Mm-hmm. but how did you end up there? What are you seeing God do through that? And what's next for the Mosher's? Mm. Okay. So how we ended up with the radio show and podcast is through my work. So I'm the executive director of recovery support services at the Matthews Hope Foundation. And so we have a detox and an outpatient uh, and a wellness clinic. And it's a faith, faith faith-based. It's it's faith-based. It's abstinence-based. It's 12-step friendly. And so God just blessed me with this amazing job that's like tailor-made to what I love to do. And, uh, and so I was not the original host. Someone else was, and then the CEO stepped in and was for a little bit. And he had me on to be a guest a couple of times and he wanted to give the radio show to me. And, uh, and I said, no, I don't want it. Um, it was, it was kind of more tailored at marketing our business, um, and, and strategic marketing on, on the topics. And I just really wasn't interested in that. I was interested in talking about resentment and fear and God stuff, right. you know? And so he was going out of town. He begged me to please host it. And I said, if I'm the host, then it's me and my husband and we pick the topics and the guests. We do it our way. And because I knew Donnie would want to do it. He loves to talk. And uh, <laughs> Don, Don, this Donnie? Yeah. What? Oh, and surprised. so he said, fine. So he gave us the radio show. We're 120 episodes in, one a week. Yeah, I think. Are we at two years now? Yeah. And, um, and so sometimes 
it gets overwhelming to try to find new ways to say the same thing or new topics. Um, but we've had some wonderful feedback. But we're also narrow on our, so it's, it's called relevant recovery radio. So we talk about addiction and recovery. So it's a pretty narrow topic. Mm-hmm. If we ever come out of that and go on to do our own show, that road will get real wide. Right. Because I would rather talk about that, Jesus, marriage, like all of it. And so, and I would like to be able to be, to dive more into 12 step ap- actions and principles and application. Boring. Uh, I know you think it's boring. <laughs> I see two uh, separate shows in the future. <laughs> so how, how do you see our work helping people? Where do you see our effect? Just, there's been people that have approached us and, and been like, Hey, I got um, this one guy. He said, I got in my buddy's car. The, he's like, are y'all on, a, on the radio? And I was like, yeah, why? Cause we just don't go around telling everybody we have a yeah. podcast. And he was like, well, I got in my buddy's car. We like to work it into conversations <laughs> smoothly. Yeah. By the way, I'm on the radio. Sorry. Uh, I'm late guys. I was just on the radio. <laughs> But I think that having people walk up and say, hey, you did this episode on this and it was exactly what I was going through or I never looked at the issue that way before. What Some of the coolest experiences I've had was people hearing the radio show that identified a substance use disorder that then called and came to the detox I work at and getting to walk alongside them and be a recovery oh, coach amazing. at them. That's amazing. What but, about you, Donnie? What, what, what about you? <laughs> that's going to so be hard to top. I went through, I went through a period... Um, I went through a period when I was really getting into the Met, when I was really getting into what we were doing, and she remembers it because it worried her a little bit, I think. I'm always worried. There are a lot of people that go into the 12-step fellowship that we're in, and they switch to church. Here's the deal. Jesus has all the power in the world, but we are so broken that we need a spiritual program of action on top of church, Mm -hmm. right? We need that extra help. You can't substitute it. You can't. Yeah. Uh, faith alone is insufficient sometimes, especially when you are a chronic alcoholic like I am. And not for salvation, though. I just want to make that Christian distinction. The reason Christians are so confused about what treats chronic alcoholism and mm-hmm. drug addiction is because we get taught that um, if, that faith alone is sufficient. That, and I'm like, yes, on salvation for and salvation, eternity. Right. But right. faith without works instead is applying it in this meat suit while we're on earth to like yeah. live out the sanctification process. Sanctification is so, different than salvation. So I was in this weird spot where I'm really being pulled to church. I'm really being pulled to church. Like I am, I feel like I'm home. And, and I'm like, I'm, oh no, he's going to leave. I'm the teaching, one thing that keeps him sane. <laughs> right. Right. And I'm teaching classes with our teaching pastor and I'm involved and I did discipleship and cadre. I'm doing all this stuff and I'm, so I called uh, a guy who has 35, 36 years sober. I knew that he was a Christian and I called him and I talked to him about it and I said, hey, here's what's going on. Uh, and he said, Donnie, I'm going to caution you. He said, church is great and you do everything you're pulled to do there, but you don't leave the 12 step fellowship you're in. And here's why you are uniquely equipped by God to be on the battlefield, to bandage them, pick them up, get them off the ground. Then they get, somebody gets them ready for Jesus. Mm, That's good. And so the beauty is, is that in this, what the way Heather and I live our lives, the thing that God has set up for us, the pattern he's given us, the life he's given us is that in that 12 step fellowship, I get to help men find God, find a relationship with God. And then I've even gotten to take a few of them a step further and help them find Christ Mm -hmm. and get baptized and go on. Um, So between those two things, between the 12 steps and between church, we're just kind of in service trying to help people build a relationship with God. Like that's... And being a part of the program, like you said, with the door being wide, mm-hmm. if they're there and they're getting... There, there's a lot of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of I get so excited when I get to sit down and a girl that I'm going to sponsor and find out she's a Christian because then I get to go there. Right. <laughs> you right. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And what's next, Heather? I don't know. You want to do another podcast, apparently. <laughs> She says she hates it, but she enjoys talking as much as I do. Have you guys found, what, or what have you found from doing the podcast and, and the way you're just so open and honest in your story? How has that helped to break the stigma of addiction? Like, how, mm. how, how do you see that offering a different perspective? I don't, I don't know that they're necessarily is still a stigma around addiction. 
Like, I know that that's something we all say. There, there is, because I don't talk about it at work. I mean, so I'm that's in your I, choice. No, no, but what I'm saying is I'm in IT. Mm-hmm. You know, in IT, we have the keys to the kingdom. I do not tell people that I'm an alcoholic. I'm right. Now I have told two or three people, people I can help or people that are real close to me. But and in general, I don't tell people I'm an alcoholic. I just, I just mean that the culture that we're in today is so obsessed with talking about feelings and plight mm-hmm. and what they're going through. And everybody likes to be a victim because then they can, I don't know. There's just this, there's this thing that people don't understand about chronic addiction of what it means to be powerless and what it means to need spiritual help. And I just think that I hope that the things that we talk about and the information that we share about the illness and about the possible solution and who needs it and who doesn't, I hope that that is educating people to understand addiction. Because I'm telling you, there's plenty of people that I've met that, oh, they did meth for five years. And when one thing happened, they just put it down and have never returned to it. Mm -hmm. And those people are on social media saying addiction's a choice. Right. And they don't understand that they were a different type of addict than what I was. Right. But here's the answer to your question, I think. After we joined the church, I was told about a men's group. It's not an official group, but a group of men that will get together every other Thursday and they have a cigar. Mm -hmm. And my friend Brian at church tells me about it and he's going to meet me there. And here I am walking up this driveway of these people's house that I don't know. And Brian doesn't show that night. (laughs) Awkward. And and the guy who owns the house is like, "Uh, who are you? What are you here for? And I'm like, I'm here for a cigar. Who, Who told you about it? Brian. Oh, well, you're welcome. Come on in. Now, it ends up being like literally 12 or 15 guys there that night. Um, he loves to do this thing where as soon as it starts to get quiet, he'll above everybody go, hey, what's your story? He wants your testimony. Now, I'm new to the Met. I'm new to these men. I'm really new to the Christian community, not to the word, but right. to the community. Um, and I don't, I'm like, you want, you want to hear all of it? And he said, yeah, I do. I gave him the entire deal, the whole story from teenager on being a criminal and doing the things that I've done and all of this stuff. And at the end of it, not one of them condemned me. Not one of them condemned me for drugs or alcohol. Not one of them. And in fact, there was a guy there named Jeff that night and Jeff's son-in-law was in town from Oklahoma. He's a cop and he had tears in his eyes. And afterwards he said, you know what? He goes, I've never got to see this before. And I said, what? He goes, the other side of what I do. Oh, wow. He said, I deal with alcoholics and drug addicts every day in my line of work. He's a cop. I wonder if he arrested me in Oklahoma. Probably. <laughs> Possibility. As many times as I can. But he, he said, I, I always see the bad side. He said, I never get to see the other side. People getting sober and staying sober. And this has been wonderful to see this and hear this and know that Jesus is working in your life. And that helps to break the stigma, I think. Along the stigma idea, I remember when I went to church in Kerrville, a group of us from the Sober Living went to a church, and we were shaking hands and welcoming people. I know. And I remember this older lady from the church came and shook my hand, and she goes, you aren't from them drug houses, are you? (laughs) Oh, no. And so I lied and said, no. You know, I was humiliated. And it was clear that this lady did not want those drug addicts at her church. And and so I think part of what we do to end the stigma is to show people that true recovery and redemption is possible. Mm -hmm. And we live completely different lives than what we did seven and ten years ago. And so even though I'm still technically a drug addict and alcoholic, and I will be until I die, I am not living in that anymore. We have been made new. God has brought me somewhere completely different. And I'm a heroin addict. And so a lot of us die. Mm -hmm. you know and don't get well and so i want people to have hope that true recovery is possible and in april i I, uh, celebrated 10 years of sobriety in august she celebrated seven years of sobriety um so if we have anybody out there listening as we wrap up we don't care that it's an hour and 20 minutes we we don't care okay (laughs) we're doing jesus's work (laughs) (laughs) with emotions so anybody that's out there that's listening that's saying Okay, I've never heard it put like this. I've never heard church folks just sit down and, and lay it out. Mm-hmm. But they go, I don't I don't know what to do next. So what what would be a step for them? Where where can somebody go? What can somebody do if they're ready to tackle some things head on or or to, to start asking the questions of how can I how can I turn things around the way you guys turn things around? Well, I mean, I can tell you that if it's a problem with a substance 
12 steps. Find a 12 step program. Look, we don't talk about the one, but it's the one. It's the one that started it all, right? right. We're not going to mention it, but <laughs> go find it. Yeah. Um, you know what? Surrender and give up. That's what we had to do. Yeah. My- we had to give up everything. We had to surrender our ideas, what we thought was going to work. We had to. You had to data self. We yes. really did. Yes. And I, I feel like um, I'm grateful for the 12 steps and the magic that they have found, the spiritual, you know, program of action that they've had for 88 years now that works wonderfully of the people who do it. But my biggest advice, if it's uh, any sort of addiction issue, is uh, the 12 steps and to uh, completely understand that you don't know what you need to do to get well. Otherwise, you would have applied it and you wouldn't be in the position that you're in now. Mm-hmm. And so you, I didn't know what I needed. But if it's not like an addiction, if it's um, spiritual, get into a good Bible-based church. They may not live close around here to go to the mat, but really try out a bunch of churches. Figure out what you're looking for in a church. Um, are they preaching right out of the Bible? Is is there possible small groups or other like ladies' night or things that you can join just to be around people? Um, reach out to the, the ministries or the care ministry team um, and to, so they can guide you because they can help whatever's going on in your life. Maybe you can't afford to put food on the table and they know of a food bank right around the corner from you. But, but also if you are seeking, if you're seeking, right? If the worldly things aren't doing it for you anymore, if relationships aren't doing it for you and money and buying things and food, if they're not doing it for you anymore and you feel like this relationship with God is what you're lacking, you know, now you don't even have to buy a Bible. You can literally on your phone download the U version Bible app. I love it. Mm-hmm. Start reading. Well, I don't know if this is true. Cool, keep reading. Well, I don't know if I believe this. Cool, keep reading. I don't know if I want to keep reading. Like that is what I did. I'm not some scholar. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. What I what I was was desperate, and I needed something different. And so I just kept reading and mm-hmm. I just kept at it because. I had met all of these Christians that seemed content and happy, and they were genuinely giving. And I'm like, well, how do you get that? And so I just kind of kept at it, and I found somebody that I could talk to that if I had a biblical question or I had a theological question, that I could get the answer. Mm-hmm. You know, but I just, I've never done this well. Any of it. I haven't done the 12 steps well ever. I haven't done my, my Christian walk well ever. I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I still make mistakes on a daily basis. The only thing consistent is the walk. Sometimes it's through the mud. Sometimes it's on a clean road. But I just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, and just trying to learn how to follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and the more I do that, like I'm convinced now that maybe God does want me to preach, which is still a crazy idea to me. But I know that before he has me do that, he's going to want me to know how to follow him. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to be a good follower before I can be a leader. And, And so that's what I would tell anybody out there is that, you know what? I had no idea it was God that I was missing. I just knew that if I had the right wife, if I just had that vehicle, if I just made the right amount of money, or if I just had the right size house, or you know what I mean? Don't forget the RV. The R- I had no idea that I kept chasing those things, but what I was really missing was God. Mm-hmm. Right. There is a content, a joy, a peace that only God can provide. And I didn't know it until I began that walk chasing God going, okay, I've, I've tried everything. It doesn't work. Lord, help me please. And once that relationship was built, and once I started to strengthen that relationship through discipline of prayer and meditation in the morning, through praying, through making amends to my wife when I would be ugly to her, like cleaning these things up and asking God for forgiveness, like this relationship began to be built between Jesus and I. And I found a joy and a peace and a contentment that I did not know was possible. Yeah, and rest assured, God will meet you right where you're at. Yeah, hundred percent. You don't have to clean up to nope. come see God. Nope. And, and and to your point earlier, I sit down and rest, and I stop doing what I'm doing, and I'm a heathen again within a month or two. Yeah. You know, of myself, I am nothing. God doeth the work. People are always like, y'all are so busy. And I'm like, but we're so selfish. So we have to be. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you don't understand. If it gets steel, we get in trouble. That's how yeah. this works. <laughs> yeah. Well, you look, I know you've been steel with me for over an hour. And I, I just, um, 
it's been so exciting to hear your story, spend this time with you guys. I do get, I am fortunate enough that I get to see you outside of all this Mm -hmm. in in just normal life. Um, But I'm, I'm just hoping that this episode reaches somebody who's sitting right where you guys have sat and and just says, man, I needed to hear that today. Mm -hmm. I I didn't never heard it quite like that before. Because God didn't fix our lives. God gave us a life that we never knew existed. We are not just fixed and improved. We're two completely different people. Yeah. We're just different completely. Like I have a life today that I literally didn't know existed. And that's probably the weirdest thing going back to like see my family or stuff. Cause they talk to me, you know, not that often. I see them maybe once a year. And so it's so interesting to me because sometimes they expect me to still be old Heather. And so like my family has all said, you know, when they're around me, it's like we're getting to know a whole new person Mm -hmm. that I'm just absolutely not who I used to be. And um, I didn't self-will that change into existence. I took some spiritual actions that were inconvenient for me over a period Mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. And and God did his thing in me. He just starts turning the knob. Yeah. 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 I love it. Well, thank can, you so much for having us here. on. Yeah, thank we you can so sit much. here all night. And so re- remind our listeners because I might have we might have listeners that want to connect with you further and, and hear more of what you talk about in your episodes. So remind them again of where you're at. Yep. So if you're in Houston, you can hear us on KPRC nine fifty. Uh, it's Sundays AM radio at Sundays at one p.m. At the end of the day, they upload that radio show to a podcast on iHeartRadio. If you want to listen to us live on Sundays at one, you can also down, download the iHeartRadio app for free and KPRC nine fifty as a channel, mm-hmm. um, or you can look for us on iHeart under Relevant Recovery Radio. Also coming soon, we will be on. We're going to upload all of our episodes to Spotify and Apple as well. And then if you have any uh, questions uh, for me or Donnie, you can always follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Relevant Recovery Radio, and you can private message me, and I'm the one that reads all of that. We're yeah. happy to help because um, I tell you what. Someone did it for me. We would be less than nothing if it weren't for God. Yeah. Yep, and you can always reach out to us at Stepping Forward, which is steppingfwd.org. We also have a section. We are also on social media, all of them. <laughs> so <laughs> you should be able to get one of us, that's for sure. <laughs> but again, hey, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks to the listeners for sticking around for an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was enjoying myself. I hope they were. <laughs> um, and as always, guys, we just want to encourage you, especially through these tougher topics, that if you need help, it's out there. Mm-hmm. Just take the first step. Yeah. Just step forward as cliche as that sounds. Step forward and God's right there. Mm-hmm. He's going to meet you where you are. Yeah. So on that note, we hope you guys have a great rest of your week and we're going to see you soon. <laughs>